Uh, okay, so um, yes, as I said, my name is Zulika Lebeau and to describe anybody, uh, myself for anybody listening, I am a white presenting mixed race woman with lots of curly red hair. I'm wearing a blue jumper and I am in front of a very overstacked white bookshelf. I'm the founder of Chronic Creatives, which is a platform dedicated to supporting artists who are chronically ill or disabled. And we have been working with Lupus UK to bring you these workshops over, well, the next few weeks, but for this week and last week is next week. I'm joined today by Louise Galinsky, who is a member of Chronic Creatives and is a disability benefits expert. And she will be delivering the talk today. Louise, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Louise. For everyone listening, I'm uh, a white woman with short white hair with color in it. I'm in my late 60s and I'm wearing a blue check dress and blue cardigan. And the background behind me is a plain whitish wall. Um, I'm a solicitor. I've been qualified for 38 years and I've been in practice with regard to disability benefits for the last 24 years. So that's me. Fantastic. Thank you, Louise. Um, so just a few housekeeping things. We will be um, doing the presentation. We'll have a, a five five or so minute break and then we'll come back for the Q&A just so everybody is aware. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. I'll just pull the slides up. Um, everybody, please bear with me. Well, as, ready, this, as this slide says, this is about disability living allowance or DLA, uh, which is now only available to under 16s. Next slide, please. This is just a, a contents of what I'm going to be talking about. Firstly, what is DLA? Some legal points you will need to know. Eligibility, the current rates, which are going up soon. Filling in the form, the assessment, what to do if your application is refused. Appeals, the appeal hearing, uh, various tips, and finally, a list of resources to help you with your application. Next slide, please. Right, disability living allowance is a non-means tested benefit for young people under the age of 16. It can help with the extra costs of looking after a child who is under 16, has difficulties with walking, or needs much more looking after than a child of the same age who does not have that disability. DLA used to be the non-means tested disability benefit for everybody until PIP was brought in. PIP is now for everyone age 16 to 65, so DLA is only for the under 16s. Next slide, please. Disability is now defined under the Equality Act of 2010 and is defined as your child is disabled if they have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative, negative effect on their ability to carry out normal daily activities. Next slide, please. DLA is governed by the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act 1992, of which sections 71 to 76 are particularly relevant. These sections set out the criteria for applying. Uh, DLA is divided into two components, care and mobility, and your child may qualify for either or both. Next slide, please. The care component is divided into three rates, lowest, middle, and highest. 
and the mobility component is divided into two subsections, guidance and supervision when outdoors and physically walking. I'll say more about these in a moment. Next slide, please. Your child will be eligible for DLA if they need much more looking after than a child of the same age who does not have a disability. However, this has to be help which is reasonably required. For example, if you help your child tie their shoelaces because they take too long to do it and you want to get out of the house quickly, that is not help reasonably required. If you help them with their shoelaces because they are unable to do it, then that is help reasonably required. If they have difficulty getting about, and they must have had these difficulties for at least three months prior to the date of claim, and at, at least, and it's anticipated that they'll have them at least six months after. If they're terminally ill, that is not expected to live more than six months, then there's no qualifying period. Next slide, please. Your child may be eligible for the care component from birth, depending on their condition. For example, if your child is born with spina bifida, which can't be corrected until they're older, then that child will be eligible from three months, the age of three months, because they must have had it for at least three months prior to the date of claim. However, they will not be eligible for the mobility component for problems with physical walking until the age of three. That is because a lot of children, the age at which children learn to walk, it varies. And it, it is generally accepted that a child who, who will be walking normally will be doing that by the age of three. So any problems with the physical aspect of walking will be obvious by then. They will not be eligible for the mobility component for needing guidance and supervision when outdoors until the age of five. This is because it's considered that children under five are not generally able to be left unsupervised when outdoors. If your child does not have a physical problem with walking, they may still be eligible for the higher rate in certain circumstances, e.g. Uh, cases of severe autism. I'll say more about that later. Next slide, please. The care component of DLA is split into three rates. The rate the child gets depends on the level of care they need. The lowest rate is currently £23.60 a week and is helped for a significant portion of the day. This is usually considered to be for about an hour overall. So say for the sake of argument, you need to prompt your child to get out of bed and get washed and dressed, but that's it. Then they may qualify for the lowest rate. The middle rate is £59.70 a week and is help required frequently throughout the day or for constant supervision throughout the day or for supervision at night or someone to help if they have home dialysis. If they have dialysis in hospital, then the benefit will not apply. Highest rate care is £89.15 per week and you will get that if your child needs help and or supervision throughout both the day and night, or if they're terminally ill. Next slide, please. The mobility component of DLA is split into two rates. The rate the child gets depends on the level of looking after they need. The lower rate is for £23.60 per week and covers guidance and or supervision outdoors. So say your child has a learning difficulty and may be likely to run off or run out in the road and they're over the age of five, 
they may well get the lower rate of the mobility component. The higher rate, currently £62.25 per week, is given if your child is unable or virtually unable to walk. This has been defined as being not, not able to walk more than 50 metres. Uh, that is usually accepted, but there may be other circumstances where they can walk more than that, where the higher rate may apply, but that is unusual. Your child may qualify for the higher rate if they don't have a physical problem with walking, but the following apply. They are in receipt of the highest rate of the care component. They have severe mental impairment and they exhibit severe behavioural problems when outdoors. This is most often given for young people with severe autism, who even when they're relatively old, say over the age of 12, still need to be heavily supervised when outdoors because they have a severe mental impairment and autism has been accepted as such, and they exhibit severe behavioural problems when outdoors. You won't get it if your child doesn't receive the highest rate of the care component. Next slide, please. The form is divided into care and mobility. After you've filled in your details, your child's details, the address of your GP and the details of any specialist who is caring for them. How you fill in the form is crucial and can determine the outcome of your child's claim. Do take pictures of or photocopy the claim form and anything you send in it, such as letters from the doctor or specialist. Do get help if you need it. Your council website, website should have a list of organisations who offer a form filling service and who can give support generally. When listing your child's conditions in the claim form, list everything. If they do not have a diagnosis, list the symptoms they have been experiencing. For example, particularly at present, if your child is having to wait for a diagnosis of what you suspect, maybe ADHD, then say we are having to wait because of the intervention of COVID. Uh, we have been recommended to apply for this benefit because it seems likely that my child has ADHD, which takes the form of the following symptoms. Next slide, please. Only list your child's current medication. If the, if the medications keep swapping around, don't list everything they've ever had as that will just be confusing. The assessors want to know how they are most of the time, not how they are at their best or worst. Don't underplay their symptoms, do tell it like it is, but at the same time, try to be concise. If you write too much, important information can get lost. You can type up your answers and attach these to the claim form instead of writing it out by hand if you find this difficult. And do include copies of letters you have from your child's GP or specialist with the claim form. For example, if you have a letter from an educational psychologist that confirms that in their view, your child has ADHD and has problems with concentration, will need prompting and supervision to eat, wash and dress and to take part in activities in, at school, then the assessor needs to know that. Next slide, please. The care activities include getting your child up in the morning, eating and drinking, managing treatment or monitoring a health condition, washing and bathing, managing toilet needs or incontinence, sensory problems. Now, these are all fairly obvious and you will be asked how often you need to help them and how long that help lasts on each occasion. So if, for example, 
your child just needs prompting to wash and bathe. You can say that they need prompting seven days a week, but the time spent in that activity, that activity is only five minutes because once they actually get in the bathroom, they can manage by themselves. Next slide, please. The rest of the care activities are dressing and undressing, verbal communication, help at night, if any, prompting and or supervision required for any activity. As I've said, you will be asked how often and for how long your child needs help with any particular activity. Now, when you're filling in this, these parts of the claim form, it's very easy to exaggerate how much care your child needs. But if, for example, you've put down that your child needs prompting to get out of bed, but they take an hour and a half each time, unless that really is the case, don't put it down because the assessor will soon see that you're gilding the lily. If your child is awarded the middle or highest rate for care, and you are providing at least 35 hours of care a week, you will be eligible to apply for carer's allowance of £67.25 a week. Now, this isn't very much for 35 hours of care, and it does come with restrictions on other earnings. So it's really only worth applying for carer's allowance if you don't do other work or if that work is part time but it is an idea before you apply to check the regulation, the regulations if you do do other forms of work. Next slide, please. Guidance and supervision needed outdoors. You'll be asked what sort of guidance or supervision your child needs, e.g. needing to hold their hand because they may run away, they're not being aware of danger, they might run out into the road, they might run up to strangers, needing help to cross the road. Now, this is very common in young children anyway. So if this is the only activity with which your child needs help, then it's unlikely that you'll qualify for this element of the benefit. Again, you'll be asked how often and for how long your child needs help with any particular activity. So say you're only taking your child to school and back, then fill in the form accordingly. But also point out that whenever you go out at the weekend, you also need to monitor their, their safety. Next slide, please. Walking. You'll be asked what your child's problems are with walking, e.g. muscle pain, fatigue, breathlessness. You will also be asked to give an estimate of how far your child can walk for having, before having to stop for any particular reason. Nearly everybody has problems with judging distances. And as the, thre the threshold is about 50 metres, say something like, uh, we live in a terraced house, on a street with uh, 45 houses on each side, my child is only able to walk past one house before they have to stop because of muscle pain and breathlessness. That will give the assessor uh, an idea of how far your child is able to walk. If you just put 30 meters, then you'll, you'll be asked how you arrive at that figure. Next slide, please. Your child may need to be assessed if the decision maker at the DWP does not think they have a clear enough picture of the help your child needs. Your child's claims form will be used as part of the assessment, so it's important that the evidence you give in the claim form is consistent with what you tell the assessor. For example, if you've only said that your child needs physical support uh, with uh, eating, but when it comes to the assessment, you list a lot of other things with which your child needs help. You'll be asked why you didn't list them before. So you do need to think through 
what your child realistically needs help with and what they may be able to do for themselves, even if they are a bit slow at doing it. The assessment is carried out by a healthcare professional or HCP, who may be anyone from the paramedic to a physiotherapist or doctor. It's possible that the HCP who assesses your child may not be a specialist in their condition. They are looking at what your child is or is not able to do as a result of their condition, not the condition itself, although what the condition is will suggest to them things that your child is likely and not likely to be able to do. If you can, take someone with you to the assessment, or if it's done in your home, have someone else be there so that if necessary, they can state what actually took, took place, as a lot of claimants dispute what the HCP writes in their report and say, that didn't happen, they didn't examine my child, they didn't ask me, whatever it is. Next slide, please. You will receive a letter following the assessment if there is one or following uh, your application if there wasn't one, detailing the decision that has been taken. If you disagree with this decision, you have one month from the date on the decision letter within which to apply for a mandatory reconsideration or MR. This step has to be taken before you can appeal. If you ask for an MR, include any new evidence which you may not have previously sent in, but remember it does need to apply to six months before the date of claim and six months, three months after, sorry, three months before the date of claim and six months after. The decision will then be looked at again and you will then receive another decision letter. If the decision remains unchanged, you will have one month from the date on the MR letter to appeal. Next slide, please. You can appeal by letter or by filling in the appeal form at gov.uk. You can ask for an appeal in person, although hearings are currently being held remotely, they're going to move on to video soon and face-to-face uh, -face appeals are going to be reinstated as soon as possible. You can also ask for the appeal to be heard on the basis of the papers only. The DWP will then put together an appeal bundle containing the claim form, the assessment report, if any, any extra evidence you sent in and all the decisions that have been taken. Your child's case will be allocated a date and the appeal bundles sent to you and the tribunal. The tribunal is a three person panel, including a judge, a doctor and a disability qualified member or DQM. The DQM may be someone like an occupational therapist, a carer for a disabled person or someone with direct experience of disability, such as sensory problems, MS, ME, or virtually any condition you can name. Next slide, please. Your child does not have to attend the hearing, although if they are an older child and are able to speak for, well for themselves about how their problems affect them, then it may be worth taking them. You can take a representative if you have one or a companion to the hearing with you. The judge will introduce the panel members and tell you what will happen during the hearing. There may be a representative present from the DWP to state their case. The tribunal won't know in advance whether such person will be attending. All three tribunal members will ask you questions about your child and they will not be looking at how your child is on the date of the hearing. The tribunal looks at how they were at the date the first decision was made. So if your child's condition has got worse since the date of the hearing, or they have new conditions since then, they can't be taken into account. It's very important to remember this. It's a bit of an artificial construct, 
because often appeals are as much as a year or more after the date of the decision. So it's difficult to think back. So do try and make notes perhaps before you go to your hearing as to how they were at the time the tribunal will be considering. Next slide, please. You will be given an opportunity to add anything which may have been left out. Your representative can also point out important in evidence in the bundle and state which rates they think apply. Your companion can give evidence, but it's important that they don't prompt you or interfere when you are giving your evidence. Often companions mean well and say something like, oh, what she meant was, oh, she's left out something. So tell them that they should write these things down and then state them all at the after you have finished giving your evidence. The decision may be given to you on the day if the tribunal has time or will be sent in the post. At the moment with remote hearings, they're being sent in the post. Next slide, please. Here's some general tips. Remember to list all your child's conditions on the claim form and how this impacts on them and the family. Think about what you need to do for your child and what they can do for themselves, particularly when you're dealing with an older child. Report all your child's symptoms to the GP so that they are on their medical records, particularly if they don't have a diagnosis. Don't be afraid to get help if you need it and do not underplay your child's symptoms. If your child is under three, remember, they won't qualify for higher rate mobility. And if your child is under five, they will not qualify for lower rate mobility. So remember that when you're filling in your claim form, as a lot of time is wasted by people appealing on these points when they're never going to succeed because that's the law. Next slide, please. These are some resource, resources you may find useful. For form filling services, you can visit SCOPE's website, it's the CAB, or your local council's website for local organisations that can help. Lupus UK have a range of resources available on web, their website. The Child Poverty Action Group Welfare Benefits Handbook, I think is probably the best one for lay people and it provides easy to understand information. It is quite expensive though, and with libraries being closed at the moment, see if you can get access to it digitally. Uh, the gov.uk carers allowance page will give you more information on how to apply for carers allowance and the gov.uk website generally has a lot of useful information on benefits and eligibility. Lastly, the disability law service provides free advice for disabled people. So that's it. I hope you found it useful. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that, Louis. Um, we will now be taking a short break, I think probably around five minutes. So we'll come back at um, 4.35. Um, for the Q&A section of the event. So please have your questions ready by then. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoy your brief rest. See you in a few minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Sorry if you can hear my uh, my chair squeaking. Louisa, how's how's your dog today? Uh, well, she's snoring away. So if you can hear someone snoring, it's not me. <laughs> We've just been to the park, and she had a good run around. That's good to hear. Saw lots um, of other dogs. Made up to a couple of ladies who had some food, quite shamelessly. <laughs> Um, well, that's fairly, that's you know, good. par for the course. Par for the course, yeah. Um, okay, so I'd like to take this opportunity to invite um, anybody who has any questions to put those in the chat so that um, Louise can answer them. And we'll ask people if they want to ask a question, um, you can unmute yourself, but I would ask you not to put your camera on just for safety reasons. Um, so yes, if anyone would like to ask a question, please go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so Louise, is there anything that, um, say, parents of particularly children with lupus should be aware of when filling out the form? Um, well, it's helpful if they can detail what type of lupus it is, as, the, as there are various types uh, which affect people differently, but also the same type will affect every child with lupus differently. So if, for example, their major problems are muscle pain and fatigue, then concentrate on that. Also side effects of medication, how often you have to go and see the specialist, whether there are further investigations being carried out, whether the specialists are concerned that uh, the lupus will lead to other conditions. So all those sort of things, yeah. But also uh, beware that if, for example, your child's condition is uh, more or less resolved in terms of what they can do for themselves by steroids and taking medication, then the DWP may say, well, they don't need any help. But of course, what you need to point out is they're only able to do this because they're on these toxic medications and that their progress still has to be monitored because even if the medication is helping, their medical condition could still go up and down a lot. Right, so you can say for the sake of argument, if your claim didn't go through and you wanted to, you had to go through to, through an appeal stage, you could point that out and that could be a relevant um, point in your case? Yes, because often um, the assessors and the DWP think that if your medication uh, means that you're able to look after yourself, then that means that you no longer have a problem. So particularly as a parent, uh, this is harder for adults, but as a parent, you still need to describe how you're able to keep your child on an even keel by supervising medication, uh, monitoring them. For example, one condition that needs a lot of monitoring is sickle cell, even if the child only has it mildly, because if your child sneezes, that may herald a crisis. So you need to watch and observe, so that will come under supervision more than help, act, physical help actually given. Okay, and uh, say for the sake of argument, I'm thinking about children with diabetes or even children with lupus who may be put on a special diet to help with their yeah. condition. Um, can that be listed as part of the claim form as well? And yes, can that it can, because it's the parent who will have to provide the special diet. And as we all know, special diets are expensive. Mm. So if you have a letter recommending a special diet, from your specialist, then um, 
do include that. Any evidence you have to back up your anecdotal evidence will be useful. Right, right. Um, so we have a question in the chat. Does it help to have a school's report on how their child is affected at school by her disability to support the level of her needs, not just at home, but at school as well? Um, their child has to have regular rest breaks to cope. Also, their daughter's diagnosis, which is autism and um, HEDS, was given over a year or so ago. Will documents about that still count? Yes. If it's an initial diagnosis, that will be important. If you don't have an up-to-date progress report, don't worry too much about that, particularly in the current climate. Nobody will be expecting that during lockdown. So yes, if your child has um, a statement and they have a one-to-one -one, uh, teacher, if uh, they're allowed timeouts because they, they need to have a rest in between classes, then by all means, get your Senko to write a letter for you. Often uh, the DWP will request such a letter themselves. So, but if they haven't done so, then by all means get it, uh, but only if it backs up what you're saying. I have seen a lot of letters from schools where they say, oh, so-and-so is a very active child, cooperates well and takes part in all activities, which is the opposite of what the parents are saying. So be careful of what they write because sometimes uh, claimants say that the schools minimize the, the help that a child needs in order to make themselves look good. Oh, aren't we great, this child, has a statement, <clears throat> but we're so good that they can participate in everything when you know that's actually not correct. So it can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Right, I'm, I'm seeing the comment in the chat. Um, it, my <clears throat> recommendation to you, if your GP is not on board, change your GP. Go to the um, Autistic Society, see if they know of anyone in the area and change your GP. It'll save you a lot of heartache. Particularly, I don't know how old your child is, but provision over the age of 18 is particularly difficult. And even if you can get provision for your child, then getting transport to that provision is again another can of worms. So if you have a sympathetic GP, they can make all the difference in, for example, getting your local authority to cough up for transport. That's a really good point, Louise. Transportation. Yeah, because when, when children are under 18, there's a lot more provision available. Provision for adults, with learning difficulties has been drastically cut. And often, even if you can get your child into somewhere, they don't assume that transport should go with it. So if your GP isn't helping you, I would say try and get a new GP. Thank you for that, Louise. I think that's a very good point. Um, particularly about GPs, I think a lot of people with lupus have had that struggle. Yes, well, particularly um, conditions such as lupus, fibromyalgia, um, any condition that applies mostly to women, as lupus does, in my view, is automatically downgraded. Although if you have a diagnosis of lupus, your GP should not be um, unsympathetic because lupus is a serious condition or can be a serious condition. I know of someone who had to have a kidney transplant because of lupus. So, you know, if, if they are downplaying lupus, then you have a serious difficulty and definitely change your GP. 
Understood, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Um, if they're not, perhaps we should close the session a little early, um, since I'm aware there are only a few of us in the talk today. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, well, I think we'll close today, unless, uh, Louise, there's anything else you've just thought of that you would like to add? Yeah, you can come unstuck on the help reasonably required thing, because a lot of parents do things automatically for their children. Um, think about what realistically what your child is able to do for themselves, because I have seen many cases where parents have carried on doing far too much for their child. I saw one recently where the parents said that they had to help their 14 year old daughter turn over in bed, even though the child had no physical conditions that suggested that that sort of help might be needed. That then undermines credibility. And once your credibility has been undermined, you've had it basically. Right, okay. So it's all about your credibility in front of the panel, well, the assessor, but then also in front of the, the panel, the DQM and so on. Obviously, uh, when you have a disabled child, the anxieties are much more profound than they are for parents um, who do, of children who don't have disabilities, but don't fall into the trap of saying that help is reasonably required because it's either easier for you because your child is too slow or that you've just got into the habit of doing it. So you carry on doing it, even though they're 35. Okay, so you have to be very careful. Yes, 